Welcome to Therapist Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. Welcome back to Therapist Uncensored. All right, our guest today comes all the way from Sydney, Australia, and I'm sitting here in our studio in Austin, Texas. Now, before we get started, let me set the stage. Our mission with Therapist Uncensored is to bring the science of neurobiology and attachment to our listeners because we really believe that this body of work helps us all build better connections with ourselves, with others, and in our communities. And recently, Sue and I did a series of three episodes specifically on attachment. And since that series, we've received numerous emails asking for practical ideas on how to integrate this body of work in one's own therapy and generally in one's daily life. So now we wish we could answer every email, but due to the volume, that makes it really difficult. However, we really are listening and your feedback and questions and needs really matter to us. So to this end, we are bringing you episodes that we feel will really give you practical, engaging ways to really make this body of work meaningful for you in your everyday lives. Now, our guest today is Richard Hill, and he is a therapist and educator and author, and he frequently speaks on the topic of neuroscience. Now, his most recent book, which is which he co-authored with Ernest Rossi, is called The Practitioner's Guide to Mirroring Hands. And it is a client responsive therapy that he's speaking of that's, that facilitates the natural problem solving and mind body healing. So Richard and I are going to discuss ways for all of us to just sort of get out of our own way, quiet that crazy internal chaos we all can get stuck in and clear the way for our mind's natural healing capacities. So, uh, Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. I've known you guys for a while, and uh, it's, it's so exciting to have something that gives us a catalyst to bring us together on, the, on this wonderful therapist, Uncensored. I feel the pressure to actually say rude words, but... I... <laughs> you get to just free that on up. <laughs> yeah, you know, but uh, yeah, no, it's you great. Can't, you can't beat our last guest. We just had somebody on our episode called The Love Doc, and he was clearly uncensored. So you have a lot of room to... Room to shoot. A lot of latitude. A lot of well, latitude uh, here. We'll take that, but we'll talk about really naughty things like being connected to not only yourself, but what is around you, of, about accessing those things that we've forgotten we can access, about actually realizing that we don't need things. What we better do is utilize things. I'm going to talk about naughty, dirty things like that. That's well, really great to have you. Okay, so tell us about your technique and your, your work. How do you help clients unlock their natural capacities? And I guess also kind of what do you mean by natural capacities? Everything we do that's beneficial, and actually everything that's not beneficial, emerges out of natural experience and natural life. Every therapy that we've got, every little version, the 476 million therapies we've got, they're just simply individuals observing a particular beneficial experience that is occurring in someone's life, pulling it out and extrapolating it and, and expanding it and exploring its possibilities and seeing it as, um, as useful. And it is useful because it's natural, because mm-hmm. it's a part of natural life. And to some extent, those things, that, all those therapies that people have pulled out which they've pulled out of natural life, you know, sitting there looking at someone with a a strange idea uh, who then gets a belief, who then gets shown that that belief is not true anymore and they fix that belief. And sure, Aaron Beck called it CBT and we practice as a thing and everybody says it's the bee's knees. We've been doing that forever. We've been doing that for thousands of years naturally. What it is, is we don't always do it usefully and we utilize facilitators to help us do that. I think what I hear you saying is that all therapy processes, part of what makes it either useful or not useful is we could have many different therapeutic models, but what is it across the board, across the line that can help engage us in a way that is useful to our own systems, which is bringing 
healing or bringing movement or hope into our systems. And it's not particularly the style exactly, but it's the engagement. It's what happens within the client and how we're able to engage the client that is part of a natural process that we're, am I getting that right? Yeah, I I think that's as best we can catch it in in the the shortness of the right. conversation we're having. But this is true. And what is it that is useful? As you say, it's the engagement. It's the relationship between the the ability for the flow of energy and information across the synaptic space, the the social space between people and within them. And the difficulty I think comes when we're saying I need it, I need it, I need it. And what we're trying to say, certainly in the Mirroring Hands book, is, no, you have it, you're just disrupted or it's interfered with. It's, it's not flowing, so you're missing it. And it's what we call the healing state, that state of improving, of finding betterness. We're just calling it in the book, we call it a therapeutic consciousness or a therapeutic awareness. And on one side of it, you've got the disrupting consciousness, the disrupting state where you've got ideas and beliefs and pathological issues and biological states that just interfere with stuff and nothing ever works. And then, of course, on the other side of a therapeutic process and a a healing sort of engagement and integrative state is the integrating state where everything that comes to you just works and is good and helps and, and builds on your better framework. So this is what you probably relate to what um, a positive psychology calls thriving. So mm-hmm. the therapeutic consciousness brings you back to a good state and then you expand on that. Whereas if you're in the disrupting state, no matter what happens, and sometimes in, in, when, you're, when you're seeking therapy or when you're getting therapy or giving therapy, you sometimes got to actually get people out of the hole before you can start. You have to get people out of the disruptive place, getting people to help be in a place where they can open up to the other, to get through the disruptive. And so that's a really important message, Richard, that you're sending is that I think also what I hear you saying is that it's helping individuals get in touch with the natural process that they have within themselves. So it isn't that the therapist, or let's say we're speaking specifically about therapy, but it could be engagement with somebody you love. It isn't that the necessarily that the answer is out there and that we get anxious to say, you know, now that I have this, I, I need the answer. Who could? It's, it's helping you slow your own system down from the place of where you may be in a disruptive state to opening up, I think what I hear you say, opening up to your own natural healing process that are already within, that have gotten blocked. Absolutely. And, you know, Ernie and I don't just talk about this theoretically. We actually say, and in, in honoring what you were saying before, okay, what's the way that's done? How is that done? And although there are a number of, of finer elements, there's three fundamental ways in which we can both move into the therapeutic state the therapeutic consciousness and also how we can recognize that we're in it as well so it's useful in both ways so sometimes when we you know we might be with a therapist or applying therapy or in a love relationship or in a social engagement and go just a little bit into the head going i'm not sure i'm just a bit uncomfortable i'm not sure what's going on so here's what here's the three elements that we think are fundamental. So what you're saying is is, is that when you experience yourself, if you find yourself or someone else in this place of what we're describing as a disruptive place, that these are the, the three aspects of trying to help somebody get themselves into a more natural spate of healing. Yeah, the three steps out, or the three steps out, the three three three, three steps out, or, and the three steps you're in when you get there. So, okay, great. Let's hear. It's actually really simple. It's really simple. The first thing that our brain needs and our mind, long and complicated discussion. Read Dan Siegel's book on mind, and we've got some of it in the uh, in the mirroring hands as well. But we need focused attention. We need our attention to be focused. So. As you can imagine, I'm talking about a disrupting state of consciousness. If you start focusing it, well, then clearly that's going to resist or shift away from a disrupting state. You're going to move towards those things and resist those things that are disrupting it. As that's the first stage, that's not always the easiest thing to do. 
right, to gain focus attention. Sometimes so it's really an important, it sounds like a quick step, just focus your attention. But that's not always an easy thing when we're a place of disruption. And just to set up the magic, when I finish describing the other two, we'll use the mirroring hands process for creating focused attention. And I'll show you just how easy it can be. Oh, good. It is. No, it's very exciting. I tell you what, when I, when I first saw it in, in 2005, it blew my mind. It just took me 10 years to really understand it. So you focus attention. Your, your attention needs to be focused. The next thing you need is you need to move into a state of curiosity or we need to trigger the curiosity frame of mind. In the book, it's, um, I actually, it's one of the appendices. We, I talk about the neuroscience of it. But we need to calm our state of fear and curiosity is terrific for that because you can't be afraid of things and curious at the same time because fear make, takes you away from things and curiosity moves you towards them. You need to be positive in your anticipation of things to be curious, again, about this fearfulness. So you, the calming, you get serotonin and the moving forward, the positive anticipation, you've got dopamine. You need to be focused. Well, we're already doing that. So that's acetylcholine and norepinephrine, which is coming in. And then you also need to feel good about this and that's the third quality of nascent possibility that there is this positive sense that something useful will come out of this experience and we re- give that reward neurobiologically with a little puff of endomorphins from the periaqueductal gray and a couple of other places so curiosity more than anything else more than happiness more than love more than all other things stimulates the entire range of important neurobiochemicals and changes the uh, chemical balance in the brain, not by disturbing intervention of anything, whether it be tablets or shocks or whatever, but just simply by the state of curiosity and then balanced by that last one of nascent possibility. So focused attention, curiosity, nascent possibility. And if you think about it, and I'm not giving you and the listeners much of a chance to think about it because I haven't got time to pause for 10 minutes. But if you think about what rapport is all about, what that making with people come into the room, we make them safe. We focus their attention on the safety. We focus their attention on you as the practitioner and vice versa. And then we start to say, this can get better. And if the client believes you, then you move forward. And this is why exactly what you were saying. It's the relationship. It's the client believing the therapist and the therapist believing that the client will also be responsive is is really so vital. So it is this relationship. So here we are. We've done all that. And I've claimed that mirroring hands acknowledges and understands this wonderful process that Ernie's developed and and allowed to emerge out of the hypnotherapy world back in the 80s. And... I just want to do it just quietly. It's a, it's a very experiential thing. And what we do is in mirroring hands, we utilize the hands to do a few things. We use them to externalize the experience. So it's fabulous when you're working with traumas or anxieties or anything. So we, we can get it away from the body, but not so far away like Gestalt does that you've kind of lost control of it a bit. You still hold it in your hands. You still have this, this capacity to hold. It's a mechanism that you can use in almost any situation. You're talking about it in a therapeutic process, but what you're saying is this is a mechanism of something that you can use in everyday life to try to help you go through this process. And the three things that you just named about finding the the focus attention, the curiosity, and the useful expectation of it being helpful that by knowing that you have these three steps and you're about to show us ways to engage that. So I'm looking forward to that. But just to help the listeners kind of help hold where we're going in this is that by the steps that you're about to go through, you're helping us figure out how to be able to get through those three steps. Because those three steps sound theoretically easy, but we all know that sometimes it's really hard to get there. It's really hard to find a focused attention or a curiosity, especially when we're in a feeling of threat, especially when we feel like the outside world is creating the disorganization or the the discomfort inside of us. To be able to slow down, to focus attention, to find curiosity and hopefulness is not the easiest thing to do. So I think what the process that you're about to share with the listener is what I'm excited about is that you have found a way 
to really bring a very complicated and deep process into a format that seems to really be something that can be held, that gives us a direction. Yes. So if we talk about a felt sense, this is a held sense. Held sense. Just made All that right. up. Never been said before. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm ready. So everybody out there, what I want you to do is just simply raise your hands up in front of your vision. So out in front of you, maybe a, a foot or so apart. And I just want you to look at those hands. In fact, really look at them. Not just like, oh, they're on my hands. No, oh, look, what jewelry are you wearing? I've got a wedding ring. That's nice. Oh, I love my wedding ring. Well, look at this. There's lots of emotions coming up in that as well. And there's wrinkles. Look at those little wrinkles. And isn't it funny the way the middle finger tends to be longer? Is yours longer or is it shorter? Are the little finger, are they spread apart? Are they the same? Now, I'm wondering, as you're really just getting absorbed, and maybe those hands are getting really, really big in your awareness now, I'm wondering if one of those hands might feel a little different, that it might want to be a bit heavier or maybe a bit cooler or if you just allow what those hands, don't think about it, don't, don't you decide, let your hand decide. And I wonder if one of those hands will just give some indication all on its own that that's the different hand. Oh, my index finger just twitched. I didn't do it. On my, it's on my left hand. Oh, yeah, my left hand really feels a bit different. Okay. Now, in the process, I'm just going to actually gently bring us out of that experience now and just let that just be a passing experience. But we've now created something extraordinary. I would hope that most people out there are actually finding it almost a bit difficult to come back to listening to me talking. They're sort of still looking at their hands going, what do I do with my hands now? So that means your attention is very focused. And if you did actually find one of your hands feeling a bit different in that very, very simple form that I showed then, different temperature, different weight, and that's how curious, how fast, I wonder what that is all about. And if actually there was a little bit of a movement, a little bit of a motor response, an idio, an idea to motor response that you didn't generate consciously yourself. Wow, we've now connected to the inner world. We've now connected to something within you that is a part of you on the implicit world, not the explicit. And I've described it in a more pragmatic sort of ways. Sometimes you're just walking along and you find you're standing at the fridge and you've pulled the fridge door open and you're looking in and you go, oh, oh yeah, I'm hungry. So you've done this motor response, this idiomotor response, quite non-consciously, your inner world is saying, oh, for goodness sake, we want some food. Will you get, oh, will you think, can you, oh, what can I do? And it just gets you there. And there's lots of things like that. Somebody, uh, the person we love comes into a room and you just suddenly find your hand is lifted up and moved towards them. You, oh, oh, uh, you pull it back in again. You might find that you're shaking hands with someone who you feel a particular connection with and you're just sort of still shaking it, not like some politicians, but actually out of good heart. And that's a fascinating thing. And what we do is we underestimate that as being just, so, well, I'm not consciously directing that, so therefore it's not important. It's actually the opposite. I'm not consciously directing that, so that's really important. That's me directly connecting to my natural processes, my natural inner self. Now the process, the, the, when you work is, so what do I do with that? We might do lots of things, a wonderful way that, we utilize the process is it allows us to differentiate, to pull things apart. So I might say to someone I'm working with who's got some trauma, so I wonder which hand, that heavy hand or the, the other hand, can receive that trauma, can just 
deal with that and hold that for a little while. And this always happens in one way or another. Things can certainly take their own creative bent and you've got to follow them. You've got to be client responsive as we talk. We're not imposing a technique or a therapy. We're actually allowing a therapy to emerge. And when you get that trauma there, and there's various things you might do. You might explore it. You might move it away. You might throw it away. And the beautiful thing about this simple aspect of mirroring hands, and there are many that we do, is you say, okay, we've got the trauma over there. Now let's look at the other hand. What can that hold? Is that your strengths? Is that your coping mechanisms? Is that your truth of which the trauma has been denying or covering up or disrupting? And I've got to tell you, magical things seem to happen, but they're not magic. Magic is natural. It's just we say it's magical because we're not controlling it or consciously directing it or somebody isn't organizing it, that it actually is organizing itself in the body's desire to seek wellness and to move into an integrating state of thriving. Because you're saying that the body has a really natural desire to move into that. It's a, it's a very natural aspect when freed up and feeling secure that we move into that state. And so what I hear you saying is by having the one hand, if I think I understand this correctly, by having the one hand for a moment hold the disruption, the thing that is creating the distress or the block, by bringing the individual's attention to say, okay, if we hold this and move it out of the way, then I think what are you saying? It's freeing the person up. It allows a space for all the other natural processes to come in, natural resources that the person inherently has to have more room for that to emerge. Am I getting that accurately? Absolutely. And that's the intention of all therapeutic processes. But a lot of the time, the therapeutic process and the imposition of this, the intervention of it, actually gets in the way of the client's working. I, I know it's a bit of a comical description, but it, it kind of describes the intent of what I'm saying is you have a client, you do this wonderful work with them, they come back the next week and they're fabulous. They say, oh my gosh, I had this incredible breakthrough and I'm feeling so wonderful. And the therapist, you know, it's not unreasonable to say, oh, and, and what was it about the therapy, meaning what I was doing, you know, the, the wonderful thing I was bringing to you. What was it that, that was helping you? And the client looks at you in a quizzical way and says, you, oh, oh yeah, you, you were doing something. I, I kind of lost interest in what you were doing. But I look behind you, there's a vase. You have these flowers behind you and you see that one that's kind of bent over, that's a bit po poked out. I just saw that. I went home, I dreamt about it. And then I had these things and all this realization comes out and I'm just a bent flower and that bent flower represents this blah, 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 blah. And off they go. And it's a wonderful reminder that the client is the one who finds and enriches themselves, that actually we can't enrich them because we're only adding to their system we can't be their system and that is the problem so that what you're saying that's a promise is we, we're adding to the system and so to be able to know whether our ability to just be there and to help facilitate the client into that system and it isn't necessarily through important insights or, I mean, those are all can be relevant, but a lot of times those are just an impetus that it, it's an impetus for the system inside the person themselves to make movement. It's not necessarily the insight. It's the insight that might come into the person's body, might free them up from what is blocked and open them up to their own process of movement. Absolutely. And this is the beauty of systems that they function, they self-organize based on the, the interaction of the elements within it. But as new elements are added and as new emergences occur, that's called feedback. And so you get this natural feedback process. And so when we put in, there's an aspect of therapeutic process that we call enactments, where a therapist actually causes a problem. Not intentionally, but it could be lots of different ways. By I know the wonderful one I saw once where a therapist was moving closer to someone because they were looking distressed, and the 
client was getting more and more distressed. And it took a few sort of movements forward for the therapist who was very wise. who said, oh, am I getting too close to you? And the client said, yes, could you move away? And then the therapist moved away a distance and the client was able to find their own balance. But By listening to their own system. And they were listening to their own system. Mm-hmm. And what's, what's important for therapists and what we say in Mirroring Hands is if you actually follow the client – once they're in the therapeutic consciousness, not so much in the disrupting consciousness, you, some people, are, you know, that you, maybe you've got to get them a job and somewhere to live and reduce their addictive process and so on and so forth. But once you're in that therapeutic process, very often, Ernie Rossi has been saying this for years and now me joining him, get out of the way. Yeah. Just allow them to do the work. And you see this in Peter Levine's work. Beautiful. He'll just say, oh, he, he just sees that if we just – add that little physical bit of sensory motory work and Pat Ogden, that sensory motor work, put that in there, then leave the client to facilitate that, engage with that, and for the healing process to occur because their healing has to occur within. So this constant pressure we have of what's the thing that's going to fix me? And it's not so much that at all. That's actually our error. It's not what's the outside thing that's going to fix me. It's where are all the outside things and the inside things that I can juggle around with to see which one produces fixing, produces betterment, what I call beneficial change. And the most important person to say that is the client. And I have have therapists saying all the time, for example, I had the other day, somebody was saying, I'm working with a client who's got this terrible trauma at seven. They can't remember it. They really need to remember this trauma. And I'm terribly worried about doing this because A, I'm not sure it actually occurred because of imposed memories. And B, what if we bring it out and I can't handle it? And I just said, well, the client's telling you a whole bunch of avenues. Certainly they would like to explore the trauma, but they didn't say they want to explore the trauma. They said they need to explore the trauma. I'd explore the need. And if I was using mirror hands, I'd say, let's put the need out in one hand and what is it doing and what is it about? How is it helping if we've got the trauma over here? And that's just a different approach. Again, it's this question I wouldn't say to someone, here's how we grow your security. I'd say, wow, where did it go? Where has the naturalness been lost? What's been the interference? There's so much more to explore than what we think is the nub of the cure. And the client is telling it to you. And for the the one when you said, going back to the example of the need, I love what you're saying, because when you say, what is the need, put the need in the hand and what you're hearing, what you're responding to is not the client's words only about the trauma, where the therapist may be making some assumptions based on that, that they need to know the details and, you know, they're, instead they're really listening. So you have a need, you have a need and it's the need, the pressure of the need that what you're saying you could hear. And so putting the pressure of the need and kind of removing that, maybe then you can access. So what's left, what is coming up? If you take the need away, what does emerge? And so it's, it's kind of a process of helping people become more clear in what it is that that could possibly free them up and what's sticking them by separating them, kind of differentiating between the two. Yeah. And differentiating. I mean, and that's a, a good description. Fundamentally though, I'm curious. Yes. I'm in a therapeutic consciousness. I'm focused. Wow, I heard you say the word need. Wow, what's that about? Because Mm -hmm. words mean all kinds of different things. And I want to find out what his possibilities are. Let's explore that. So in that process, you're engaging with a client in their own curiosity. You're engaging with the curious. I'm curious. I'm curious about their curiosity. Right. Could you bring maybe some, before we wrap up, because we're getting close to needing to end, could you bring maybe some examples more specifically of different ways that you've used the specific technique that's in the book called Healing Hands of Doing This? Could you give an example? Yeah, there's a couple of quick ones, and we write them into the the book, and we do lots of examples in the book, lots of case studies so people can get it. The one I use in, in the introduction is a beauty. Because one of the great things about mirroring hands is working with something when you don't know. 
when the client mm. doesn't know, when neither of you know. So just, just put it in the hand. Let's see where it goes. And we allow the expression to have. And I had a client, uh, a woman came in, knocked on my door, came into the office, knocked on my door. I was sitting doing something else. And she said, I'm going off to another psychiatrist. I've seen everybody. I've read everything. No one has helped me. No one could say anything that would help me. You've got brain training on your poster at the front. I don't know what that means. I'll come back and you've got 60 minutes. I thought, interesting challenge. So I said, okay. So she came back and she was fiddling around and doing various things. Now, when you really understand and when you've absorbed the mirroring hands technique, well, it's really a very improvisational process. Although we have lovely ways of getting in, like we did that little one, getting into the therapeutic awareness. But sometimes someone, and she was just flapping her hands around. And I said, wow, look at those hands flapping around. And we started working with the hands. What's in that one? And what's in the other one? And eventually... What happened was what emerged out of this experience, and I stopped talking for some periods of time. There's very little talk in mirroring hands, very little hard work done by the therapist, a lot of hard work done by the client. And what emerged was a hand that totally covered the other hand. And we threw a few gentle sort of suggestions. Can you share with me a few words about the hands? And she said, the hand underneath is my natural self. And the hand on top is the self that protects me from everything that has tried to hurt me. Cutting a long story short, she said, and everyone's been trying to cure the top hand. And I said, yeah, what happens if we take away your protection? You're then totally vulnerable. And I think I said to her something in the vein of, do you think we really need the protecting hand anymore now you're older? She said, well, maybe not. I said, maybe we give it a rest for a little while. Anyway, she did something, pulled the hands apart. Her eyes went bing. I said, can you share with me some of the things that are happening with you now? She said, no. And I said, that's fine. That's your own private inner work. It's not up to me to know. And uh, anyway, we did a bit more. She stayed about an hour and a half. She gave me some money. She left. I never saw her again. But she had an experience that she said was impossible to have. Another one is just quickly, my daughter was in Beirut doing it as a journalist, and we extraordinarily and very dramatically found that she had a, a tumor, fortunately not invasive, but on a, on a scalp. She's very worried about it. She rang me from a staircase in Beirut, not wanting to go home to her husband and upset him and starting to have anxiety about this, this drama. She talked to me about what the doctor had said. And I said, that's really good, but she's having this anxiety. And I thought, I don't know what to do. I, yes, I do. She needs to get this out of herself so I said, now, can you see your hands? And then, like, you know, smack her and blurt. I thought, my God, she's on the phone, you idiot. She's holding my hand. So you don't even have to use hands, although they're really great. I said, can you see your knees? And she said, yes, I've got my feet up on the step below me. I said, wow. So we did the first ever mirroring knees therapy. Never done it since. And I said, look at those knees. Focus your attention. Tell me about the threads. Tell me about the cotton. And she said, oh, wow, this one on the right has got all sort of holes and it's bad. The thread's really messy. And the other side is much newer. I said, well, if we're going to put this anxiety somewhere where we put it, she said, I'm going to put it on that one with all the holes and the faults in it. I said, great, put it there and let's put it there. What we do with it? And we did some things. And I said, okay, so now what does the other knee tell you? What's it telling you about you and about your life and about your dad and about your husband? And she then spoke to me about the order and the, how everything was in place and, and that if you just got away from the things that were torn and broken, you could do it. And it was beautiful, beautiful stuff. She recovered from the anxiety attack. She was able to brush those things away from her knees and she went back home. I tell you, as a father was the most relieving experience. And she had it out and she recovered and she's brilliant. She's just had a baby and everything's wonderful. So pretty extraordinary experiences in pretty extraordinary circumstances. So you can imagine how effective it is in more regulatable circumstances in almost anything at all, almost anything at all. And in conjunction with other therapies as well. Well, that's what I hear you saying in conjunction with other therapies and in, like we said, in everyday life too. And it, what it sounds like in your daughter's case, I love the example, is that her worry and her worry for her husband and her worry for herself and that she, in that process, she was just overwhelmed. And for you to move the, to help her to, to, to remove the anxiety, the fear. 
So in, in one hand, when you say, let's put the disturbance, the disruption in this one hand over and move it to the side, you're not saying make it go away. You're not saying ignore it. You're not trying to intellectualize because oftentimes we're like, you don't need to be worried about that. And we speak straight to the intellect. Instead, we're like, we trust that you're feeling anxious, you're worried. So we're just going to, we're not going to throw it away yet. We're just going to put it to the side and without the disruption and with the focus, it sounds like then she was able to find her curiosity. She was able to say, okay, so without that, she was able to find her own curiosity about what was going on and find her resourcefulness. That's right. She found it and she did all this and we did all this in the space of 10 or 15 minutes on a phone, you know, 8,000 miles apart. Oh, that must have been so rewarding. What a joy. And they're just two examples. I mean, we've got dozens more in the book. And, and uh, now that's not to say I use mirroring hands in every therapy. Of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. It emerges. I would suggest that at the end of a, a good therapy session, you could probably tally up a dozen different therapeutic styles and modalities that you're quite comfortable with and you're aware of. And some observers might say, oh, yeah, you did a bit of so-and-so therapy there. And I go, oh, did I? And that goes back to my comment that these therapies aren't brilliant. These therapies are just brilliant observations of life. And uh, this is this is what the, uh, when they say of Erickson, people call him a genius of manipulation. And Rossi says, no, he's not a genius of manipulation. He's a genius of observation. And if you're sensitive with that observation and you're seeking that expression of movement within the person and the movement between the people, and be it therapy, be it relationship, be it family, be it social, a message to all listeners when not just in therapy, but just in trying to, as you're learning about yourself, as you're learning about things, that the process of trusting that likely you have all sorts of resources inside you that you're just waiting to be tapped into and that the part of the therapeutic process or the connection with anyone is helping yourself get to a place to tap into it so that then what you mentioned earlier is that you don't use mirroring hands and everything. It would lose its power. But the dynamic of helping somebody find a focus, because mirroring hands is a technique to help you get to the three aspects that are so important in all aspects. And that is being able to move from a place of being triggered or charged or angry or the, or the emotions that we get caught up in. And instead knowing, okay, wait, I've got to find my focus and I've got to find my attention and that I've got to bring myself into a sense of curiosity. But, you know, we also probably have to tap is not just curiosity about self, but curiosity about the other person, curiosity that transcends ourselves, curiosity about the world and getting out of just the, why am I feeling this bad? Because some people would say, I would think, oh, if I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious about what's going on inside of me that's making me feel so bad. And that might actually prompt an external view of blame. And that's not at all what you're saying. You're saying it's, it's finding a sense of curiosity as well as curiosity about the other. What is it about this other person who's saying these things that may be making me angry? What's their experience? Let me find my curiosity that's going to bring out a relational engagement rather than a self-focus. Yeah, and it's, it's sort of unregulated curiosity. I mean, when a lot of the times you're using the word curiosity there, I would say, no, that's not curiosity. Right. Like, I want to know this, and I need to know that, and I have to know all those things. That's not curiosity. That's requirements and demands and pressures. Curiosity, and I, I give it three frames, three sort of what should be equally balanced pillars. The, the curiosity for information, sure, we need to know mm-hmm. stuff. And that's important. We have natural cycles. We talk about those in the book, too much to go into again, and rhythms. But there's also the curiosity for the unexpected. So we do that through play. So we get someone to be curious about the facts. Then we play with them and other things emerge. And that's all to do with self-organizing systems and various things, which again, we talk about in the book. But the one that's really been relegated to other aspects of experience is the curiosity for meaning and possibility and engagement. This, this sort of, I'm not just curious about what it is. I'm not just curious about what I can know about it. I'm curious about where it takes me. And this is the curious approach to what can I create out of this? If you actually wake up first thing in the morning, 
in a, I think curiosity can be a state of being. And if you wake up in the first thing in the morning in the psychoneurobiological, chemical, biochemical milieu of wondering what's possible and what might happen, what might emerge out of the day, that it will give you greater meaning and purpose, then that's a hell of a nice way to wake up. I look over at my partner first thing in the morning and I think, just being with you is something's going to happen today that's going to be amazing. And maybe it'll be an argument that will teach me about how much of an idiot I am. Or maybe it'll be a loving moment which will teach me about how kind I am. But whether I'm learning about what are considered to be good things or bad things, I'm learning about things that I can create with. And that's the magic of life, being at the center of an ongoing, interconnected, creative experience. And that is actually my definition of the purpose of life, to participate creatively in the experience Mm -hmm. and mirroring hands and the book, not only the practice, but the lifestyle, the way of life. Thank you, Ernest Rossi. That's all I can say. You can feel your own gratitude at the moment. You just, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for coming on our show and sharing this, at least the last decade of deep work and passion. And the book that y'all, the book, by the way, will be in our show notes and you'll be able to click on and get more information as all the other information that we've left in here. But really, Richard, thank you so much for coming and being able to share and give hope because I love the, the ending that you're bringing to it. And that is that a life with meaning and hope that those are so important and to have a, have a process to know that no matter what level of disruption or difficulty you're having, that there are ways, many, many ways and avenues to try to find a sense within yourself, whether it be what we talked about today or many, many other ways as we'll continue to be able to find what really rings to you as a listener to find your own sense of resources and hope and meaning within you. So that, I mean, that's just a message of security to know that there is, if we can help ourselves get out of our own way and do it in relation with others, that's so important that we can find our own resourcefulness. And I think that the the sense that these things like to be found. That's true. And we know this because when we look at what happens with the genes, we can see it. We can see it in the immune system. What happens with our mental states? What happens with the shifts in our various neurochemicals and various hormones and things? We like to find those things. We just struggle finding it and a lot of times interfere with it as well. Again, what's natural? Why does mindfulness work? Well, mindfulness must be natural. So how did we develop a positive response to this pause, this uh, engagement with a sense of, of beauty and wonder and awe, and then a, a gentle engagement with others. Well, I would suggest that over evolutionary time, that there was a moment in every day, maybe not taken every day, but there was a moment in every day where people stopped doing their work. They then were surrounded and affected by an extraordinary experience that just amazed them and wondered them and gave them a sense of both their connection to the universe but also their smallness in the universe. And then following that, they then went in and spent time with others and engaged in true interconnected, integrating space. And I would say that that period of time over evolutionary space is called sunset. And mindfulness works because we take ourselves to the sunset. We feel the numinosum. So if you started doing mindfulness, keep doing it, but step out each day into the sunset. And sometimes it's at sunset. Sometimes it's in the rising of the sun. And sometimes it's in the rising. It's when your children come home. It's when you fall into the embrace of your partner. It's when you engage in that most beautiful coffee and, and, and food. It's when the owner of the cafe comes and talks to you about their day and there's so many places and the opportunities for these occur possibly every couple of hours during the day but certainly sunset is the mindfulness experience that has enabled the benefits of this pause to really be hardwired because it's been happening to us for a long long time 
And have you ever been able to see a sunset and not be awed by it? Yeah, when you can really see it, it's, it's, that's a beautiful. It's gonna. Next time I see a sunset, I'm going to think of you in this very moment. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Richard, for joining us. I know our listeners are really going to appreciate all the input you have. And, and if anybody wanted to get a hold of you, where would they do that? The easiest is the website, so uh, www.richardhill.com.au. Dot .au. Yeah, just a dot for- .au at the end. Standing yeah, some, for Aussie. <laughs> yeah, so some real estate agents got richardhill.com, so we don't want to go there. <laughs> All right. All right. And for the listeners out there, uh, this podcast is a labor of love. And if you find it valuable and meaningful to your life, please feel free to pass it on. But it would also help us deeply for you to take a moment to rate, review us, and just give us your feedback. It's It really matters to us uh, and goes a long way. It's greatly appreciated. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.